As we continue on in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 today, a very uh, interesting and dynamic chapter, really concluding a section for us, uh, actually beginning uh, another section, but concluding one about the superior person of Christ. That was chapters 1 through 6. Uh, Christ was better than the prophets, chapter 1. He was better than the angels, chapter 2. He was better than Moses in chapter 3. He was better than Aaron in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Uh, and, you know, this is wonderful to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ because he established a better covenant, a new covenant for us, a better offering, which is his body. Instead of the Old Testament bulls and goats and uh, whatever they offered in the Old Testament through the priest, high priest, but Jesus Christ offered himself also a better sanctuary since it's a heavenly sanctuary where the high priest, king priest, Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, the king priest administrates our, his high priestly office at the throne room of God for us, ever able to make intercession for us. And the Bible says uh, he's a perfect high priest. He perfectly suffered. So he perfectly understands what you and I are going through. Isn't that good to know that in 2009, <laughs> like I say, some of the issues that we went through economically in our country and some people went through personally and you read about, I was just going on the Internet today looking through a bunch of things and having to run across foreclosures and realizing all the people today that were listed that are losing their homes here in Tampa Bay. I mean, it's a lot. It's pages and pages of people whose homes are being repossessed today. People are, are hurting right now. A lot of people are looking uh, for answers, and they're saying, where do I go from here? Well, uh, I believe that Jesus Christ understands. He understands what it means to be homeless. <laughs> uh, even his mother didn't find a place to bear him. He had ended up in a manger. Uh, you know, she, I'm sure Joseph took her to some of the best hotels in town. After all, he said, this is the Son of God that's being born here. Uh, let's do the best we can. And every place was filled. And so Jesus ended up going, uh, being birthed in a manger. Uh, you know, so Jesus understands. I mean, right from the beginning of his life, he humbled himself. God was showing us what it meant to not be in the palace, but to be in, in a manger and to walk upon the earth as Jesus did. Most of his ministry was outside. Most of Jesus' ministry was um, among the people. He loved to go to the poor. He was known as one that helped the poor. Second Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound, having all sufficiency and everything. You may have an abundance for every good work. And then verse 10 says there, for he scattered abroad and it gave to the poor. Therefore, his righteousness endures forever. Who's that talking about? That's talking about Jesus. Jesus gave to the poor. Therefore, his righteousness endures forever. And, and, you know, the Bible talks a lot about uh, the heart of Christ and how he reached out. And we're going to see even today. Uh, as we get into the superior priesthood of Melchizedek, and it's actually uh, four chapters on this powerful subject, and uh, this is something that's not dealt with lightly. Who was Melchizedek? We're going to be looking at that. Some believe that he was actually a Christophany in the Old Testament, that he was a preexistent form of Jesus Christ that appeared in the Old Testament. As many have seen many Christophanies, you know, the, the angel that appeared unto Joshua, many believe was a Christophany. What's a Christophany? It's a, it's a pre-existent uh, revelation of Christ on earth, the person of Christ before he was born of Mary. Uh, and I believe this, this is, is, is true, that Jesus Christ even appeared in the Old Testament days. And uh, uh, he appeared, of course, in a pre-existent form that he, he came in as, uh, to this earth and the body and through Mary and the birth and all. But many believe that Melchizedek is that pre-existent Christophany, a uh, revelation of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You see, the whole book is about Jesus. I mean, you read the book of Revelation, and it says this is the book about the testimony of Jesus Christ. It starts with that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, where, uh, you know, it, it says uh, Mary would uh, would give birth and that her seed would birth. And, of course, the seed is always in the man. But we, we find here in the virgin birth of Christ already prophesied in the Old Testament about Jesus. And so the whole book is about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of the coming Christ. And this Old Testament priesthood is also a picture of the New Testament priesthood of Christ. And so we find the superior priesthood is a better order. Uh, Melchizedek is a better order than Aaron. And then a better covenant, old, not new. We're going to talk about that tomorrow in chapter 8. And a better sanctuary, which is a heavenly sanctuary, not earthly, in chapter 9. And then a better sacrifice, which is God's Son, not animals, in chapter 10. So the next four days, we're going to be actually studying the superior priesthood of Christ. 
And this is a very exciting subject because it shows us what Jesus Christ is doing now for us in the heavenlies. What he is doing at the right hand of the Father now as he applies his blood at the throne room of God, as he applies his work, his finished work, on our behalf. Because it re- makes us realize who we are in Christ and what he is doing for us today. And then we find uh, at the end of the book of Hebrews in chapters 11, 12, and 13, a superior principle, which is the su- principle of faith. It's the highest principle of God, and we have examples of faith in chapter 11. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then the endurance of faith in chapter 12, we're going to be seeing uh, that we're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. And then finally, the evidences of faith in chapter 13. Now, we have five major warnings through the book of Hebrews. I'm kind of reviewing today because we've been out of it a little bit over the holidays, and I want us to get it. And so we have these five warnings all through the book of Hebrews. And they all have to do with the Word of God. You see, God measures our spirituality and our effectiveness on the way we relate to the Word of God. The the, the ability you have to allow the Word of God to touch your life, to change your life, to affect your life, to, to give you life, is the way that you are measured spiritually. And there are five warnings in the book here of Hebrews. First of all, it's drifting from the Word of God through neglect in chapter 2. We studied that. Second is doubting the Word of God through hardness of heart in chapter 3. We studied that. And then we found in chapter 5 the dullness toward the Word through laziness, through sluggishness. We become dull toward the Word of God. We don't have our senses exercised to discern between good and evil. And it's only the entrance of the Word that does that, because the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you want to make right decisions in 2010, fill your mind and your heart with the Word of God. Let the wisdom of God's Word fill you. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And how do we know about Jesus' mind? How do we discover the mind of Christ through the Word of God? The Word of God, both the written Word and the living Word, Jesus Christ, are in harmony. And so the third warning is dullness toward the Word. And then the fourth warning is despising the Word through willful rejection. And then finally, disobeying the Word. That's chapter 10, by the way. We're going to get there in a couple of days. And then disobeying the Word by refusing to hear in chapter 12. And these are warnings that God gives us. I know that I love to preach positively all the time, but God gives us these warnings in Scripture. What is your relationship to the Word of God today? Do you read it with openness and say, God, change my life? Show me who you are in the Word. Show me who Jesus is. Show me who I am. And then face it honestly. Don't just pick your favorite Scriptures. Go through the Word of God systematically, as we do in this uh, teaching on on the radio. Going chapter by chapter, we've taught through Ephesians from Philippians and Galatians and Colossians and Romans and Acts. We've taught these in, through these entire books these last months. Chapter by chapter covers every subject. If you'll read the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation this year, every subject will be covered in your life. Business decisions. The subject of sex will be talked about. The subject of relationships, how to maintain right relationships with God and men. The subject of heart and conscience will be talked about. The subject of your mind will be talked about as we read in Philippians. (laughs) Have the mind of Christ. Every subject will be dealt with in your life if you get in the Word of God. If you want to know about life's answers, go to the Bible. God's Word is quick and powerful, as I said earlier. The entrance of the Word brings light. You will not know who you are, who God is, or what you're to do in this world and your destiny without the Word of God. The Bible is powerful. That's why, man, you carry a Bible, as I did today in the Starbucks, and everybody kind of looks. <laughs> it, it always amuses me. I was studying for the radio broadcast today. I was over there at Starbucks. And, and you know, just having a Bible sitting open on the table is incredible, the amount of attention that brings. It's like, whoa, you know, I mean, this guy's reading the Bible right here in public. It it amazes me. It's like the name of Jesus, you know what I mean? And that's why do people curse in Jesus' name? 
because their heart is rebellious, because their heart is sinful and desperately wicked. I don't hear anybody, hear anybody say, oh, Buddha. No, I don't hear that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, what, what People curse in the name of Jesus because they know that name is powerful. They know that name is life-changing. And that's why it's a curse word to them. It's just interesting to me that even the greatest sinner in the city is going to acknowledge the name of Jesus in a curse word. Tells me the power of that name. And today we're talking about Jesus Christ, a superior priesthood. I love this section. It's, it's referring to Christ and Melchizedek. And first of all, see the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is, is Paul, is giving uh, three arguments here. In chapter 7, let's look at those quickly. Number one, he's given a histor an historical argument about Melchizedek and Abraham. You see, first he identifies uh, Melchiz Melchizedek as a type of Christ. And we're going to be reading out of Hebrews here, showing you, uh, you know, exactly what, what's, what, what Paul said here. Let's read it, okay? Chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings... And blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, or peace, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descendant, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office to priesthood have a commandment to take tithes to the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them receives tithes of Abraham. You see, Melchizedek was not of the tribe of Levi which was the high priestly tribe of the 12, children of Israel, uh, uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed to the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but, he, uh, but there he received them, of whom it is written that he lives. And as I might say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes to Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, the coming 12 tribes of Israel were in the loins of Abraham, and even in the loins of Abraham, that priestly order, that earthly priestly order of Levi was paying tithes to Melchizedek. So there's, here's an historical uh, argument. Here he is called the king of peace, or literally prince of peace. The name Melchizedek is two from two Hebrew words, really. Melchi. Melchi and Sedek, which literally means king and righteousness, which certainly applies to Christ. You see, Christ is God's righteous king. He fulfilled all righteousness. He came and lived on this earth a perfect life, unlike the children of the Levi. They were not perfect, as we're going to see later. Some of the some of the priestly people, uh, actually priestly uh, children, sinned, as we're going to see in a few moments. But not Christ. Christ was the perfect order of the priesthood, and his priesthood is eternal, has no beginning or end. It didn't depend on any natural descent. There is no lineage mentioned about Melchizedek. You see, every priest that descended from, from Aaron died, but not Christ. He abides a priest continually. He died, but he rose again, of course. And like Melchizedek, his priesthood is eternal. You see, now, uh, how is Melchizedek superior to Aaron? I mean, Aaron paid tithes to Abraham. I'm, I'm sorry, Melchizedek, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, I should say. I'm sorry. Yet, while well, unborn in the loins of Abraham, as I said. So the less was blessed of the better. And so we see, first of all, there's a historical argument that Melchizedek was of a better order than Aaron. Secondly, there's a doctrinal argument. 
I mean, having uh, clearly established the historical foundation of the superiority of Melchizedek, Paul now shows that Melchizedek is a superior form of it from a doctrinal viewpoint. Here he quotes uh, Psalms 110, verse 4. Now let's look at the four or the three things doctrinally that Paul teaches about Aaron and Melchizedek. Number one, Aaron was replaced by Melchizedek. When, when God said to Christ in Psalms 110 verse 4, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he was looking at repla- replacing the Levitical priesthood founded by Aaron with a better priesthood in Jesus Christ. It's impossible for two divine priesthoods to operate side by side. The fact that God established a new order proves that the old order of Aaron was weak and ineffective. And it meant that under the law, under which Aaron functioned, was also likewise weak and ineffective. What does he say in verse 19? For the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. Come on. Paul says doctrinally, this order of Melchizedek was a better order. Because the Old Testament, the Old Testament was not made perfect. That order had no perfection. But I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ brought a perfect priesthood. After the power of an endless life, he said in verse 16, who was made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Aren't you glad that the order of Jesus Christ is never going to change? That as he intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father, that priesthood is going to stand forever? We are going to constantly be declared holy and righteous in his presence by the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus shed his blood, and then he applies the blood. Now, so first of all, Aaron was replaced by Melchizedek. Number two, Aaron was not ordained by an oath. That begins at verse 20. For inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest, for those priests which uh, priests were made without an oath, that is the Aaron priesthood, did not take an oath. Why? Because they were not permanent. God did not want to permanently establish the priesthood of Aaron. I mean, there were elaborate ceremonies according to Exodus 28 through 30. Those, if you read those two, three, two chapters, you'll read about that priesthood of Aaron. But we have no record in those two chapters of any kind of a divine oath that sealed their priesthood. In fact, God would not seal the order with an oath because he knew that their work would only come to an end, and it has in Jesus Christ. But when he ordained Christ to be a priest, he confirmed it with an unchanging oath. So not only, you see, Paul's arguing doctrinally, not only was Aaron replaced by, by Melchizedek, which was Christ, but Aaron was also not ordained by an oath, and Jesus Christ was. Let me read about that in verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this one, Jesus, with an oath by him that said unto him, Lord, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus Christ made a surety by a better testament, an oath that God made, that he would establish this priesthood forever. And then thirdly, Aaron and his successors died. He begins that argument in, in verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Aaron was not the only high priest. There were many high priests in the Old Testament, but they all died. But this man, Jesus, because he continued forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Come on. Wherefore, he's able. Mm, Now, this gets into good. Now, this gets into the practical argument. See, first of all, first of all, we saw the uh, we saw the historical argument of what happened between Abraham and Melchizedek. Then we saw the doctrinal argument that Paul gives in this chapter. And finally, the practical argument. It, it, It has to do with Christ and the believer. You see, such a high priest became us. What does that mean? Mean? It means that it suits us. It meets our needs. It fits into our situation. <laughs> Let's read it here in verse 26. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Oh. 
this priesthood, Jesus Christ, was holy, harmless, and undefiled. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. Aaron himself made a golden calf and led Israel into idolatry, if you remember. When Moses went up into the mountain, he came out of the mountain, and here Aaron had participated. What about Eli's sons? They were guilty of gluttony and immorality. You see, the high priests of the Old Testament were not perfect. There was record of some very great violations even to the Old Testament law of the priesthood. That's why God established a better order in Jesus Christ. He was the perfect high priest. He is holier than any of the priests on earth. He is higher than any of those ministering because he's ministering in a heavenly tabernacle in the presence of God. Let's read the rest of the chapter. Wow. Moving along today, aren't we? (laughs) For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for himself, his own sins. For then for the people, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. So Jesus Christ offered himself up as one sacrifice for sins forever. We're going to find about that in, in Hebrews chapter 10. But the Old Testament priesthood had to offer sins daily for their own, I mean, offer sacrifices for their own sins daily. Christ is sinless. He needs no sacrifice to atone for his sins. And the one sacrifice that he offered settled the sin problem for all eternity. Not only that, he offered himself as the sacrifice. It's not the blood of bulls and goats, as I said earlier. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb, perfect Lamb of God. What a high priest we have. (laughs) Aaron and his sons had infirmities of one kind or another, but Christ is free from all sin and weakness. That's our high priest. It's easy for us to see then that the order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Aaron. That's what he's talking about. It's proved historically. For Abraham honored Melchizedek above Levi. It's proven doctrinally, as we read in in really Psalms 110 uh, verse 4. Definitely states that God has made a change in the priesthood. And that it's proven practically. No man could ever qualify to be this high priest that's talked about after the order of Melchizedek. It had to be Jesus Christ. There's no need to look for another. We have Christ and that's all we need. Now, what is, how does this translate out into our life today? Well, a lot of teaching in Hebrews gets heavy, doesn't it? <laughs> that's the nice thing about teaching through the Word. and uh, You know, it's, it's the meat of the Word that we have to get into sometimes, not just the fluff. You know, in fact, the theme of the book of Hebrews is let us go on unto perfection, unto maturity. Not laying again the foundation from dead works. <laughs> That's talked about in Hebrews chapter 6. See, some of the believers there in, in, in that day that Paul wrote about, uh, some of them were going back to Judaism thinking that it was a superior way. Oh, they tasted of Christ. They've tasted of the word of God that in, in Hebrews 5. They, they, they've sensed the grace of God. And then they decided to move back to Judaism. I'll tell you what, there's no comparison. Once you really understand who Christ is and what he's done for you, you'll never go back. There's no reason to. You'll go on into the work of Jesus Christ. Because you are buried with him. You are crucified with him, buried with him, risen with him, and seated with him in heavenly places, and now reigning with him. That's your Jesus Christ. That's your Lord. That's your high priest. And he is a faithful high priest, as we found out in in, in Hebrews chapter 6. He's faithful. He's able to perfectly understand our situation. He knows what you're going through today. I keep saying that, but I have to get it in your mind. You must understand. When I go to the Lord in prayer, when I lay out my heart to him, and I simply pray and let Jesus Christ represent me to the Father, I'll tell you what, he does it perfectly. He understands perfectly what I'm going through. He suffered at all points like as we yet without sin. 
All we need to do is by faith realize who he is now and let him do what he wants to do for us, and that is save us to the uttermost. That's what it says. Why is he able to save us to the uttermost? Because he is that faithful high priest, able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him, seeing he ever lived liveth to make intercession for the saints. That's, that's what it says there in Hebrews. Able to save to the uttermost. One fellow says from the guttermost to the uttermost. And that's absolutely true. Wow. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. If you've not received Jesus, my passion for you today is to receive the Lord. Let him apply that blood for you right now, would you? Let him apply his blood right now at the right hand of the Father. When I came to Jesus as a nine-year-old boy, I remember the night at the front of that congregational church that I knelt, and a man put his big arm around me. He had seen me stand there. I was under such conviction. I was shaking on that hot July evening, and he just touched me on the shoulder and said, Young man, God's dealing with you. And I said, I know he is, and I started to cry. I was under such a conviction. I was literally shaking, and the Spirit of God moved, moved on me that night. Nine-year-old, man, I just moved out of that aisle and down to the front of the church, and, and he came and put his arm around me, and he told me what the preacher had said, and that is that God love me and Jesus could save me right there and I'll tell you what I was ready to receive Jesus and I received Christ that night and I prayed that prayer I invited Jesus into my life and you know what I've walked the Lord with the Lord now these many years I mean what I'm 67 so uh, what 50 some years now I've not doubted that salvation I have to tell you honestly, over those 50-some years that I've walked with Jesus, I've never doubted his salvation. Why? Because he's able to keep those. God is able to keep those that he has brought in. Jesus, our high priest, is able to sustain us, to keep us. You see, I've never received Jesus that way in my life. You may know about him through religion. That doesn't save you. You might see the kingdom of God at a distance, but you need to enter it through the work of Jesus Christ.